Hello and welcome back to the 1DMC podcast. It's a weekly show where I sit down with my psychotherapist and we interview people. People from all walks of life. Sporting stars, psychologists, actors, musicians, generally vibey people. I don't know. Lots of people. Lots of interesting people. And we've had great guests so far and we've got lots of really interesting guests to come. Today's guest is no different. Shane Carthy is, well, everyone will know him as the Dublin footballer. Um, I know him as a guy who has a very similar mental health history to my own. Shane uh, recently released a book called Dark Blue, which I had the privilege of reading and discussing with him today. I'd recommend you pick up the book. Anyone who has experienced depression or feels like they might be experiencing depression um, should read this. Now, it's a tough, tough read. Um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, there was a weekend there where I was extremely emotional uh, reading it. It brought back a lot of um, heavy memories for me. And there were moments where I felt like, you know, there was turning points in, in my own life where I could have gone um, as far as Shane did. And, you know, I could have been hospitalized just like Shane. But I was probably a little bit more um, open with the people around me than Shane was at the time. And I told the right people, and I had breakdowns in front of the, the people who needed to see it. And thankfully, um, it didn't get it as bad as perhaps Shane experienced. But we have a, a very interesting dialogue back and forth. Shane is a similar age to myself. Um, I think he grew up with uh, pressures. You know, he perhaps from the outside in looked like he was living the idyllic life. Extremely talented, um, you know, the shit hot footballer. In the locality, grew up in Port Marnock in Dublin, a beautiful part of North Dublin if you're not familiar with it. And I think from very, very young, he was the guy, you know. But that doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean much when inside you're experiencing turmoil, you know. It doesn't mean much when you're in front of 82,000 people kicking a football um, and you feel fine during the game, but then as soon as you go home, you're an emotional wreck and you can't understand why, you know. He thought it was hormones wasn't hormones he was experiencing depression now trigger warning for this episode we do talk about suicidal ideations um shane did experience them as have i so if that is something that you're not ready to hear then i would uh, encourage you to maybe press pause in this one listen to a different episode wait for the next episode um, but you know fair warning this is uh, an episode that i think you're going to have to sit down take the time to listen to there's a lot of banter back and forth but it's a very serious topic and shane's book is a very serious book i would say now i won't babble on because i tend to do these in the last fucking two minutes so this is episode nine of the one dmc podcast with shane carthy enjoy the episode jump out the bed i got a good yes, reason moving the curtain see the sun through the cold seasons i got my hoodie because my bones freezing a morning couple for the soul be the most amazing. Shane Carty, welcome to the One DMC podcast. Um, I always say this, but I just want to thank you uh, first and foremost for agreeing to come on um, and for giving us your time. Um, I know that everyone is going through a difficult period at the moment, mm. um, but things like this can kind of, I think, pull us out of our, our, our stupor. Um, and I'm hoping that we're going to have a, a great chat. Perfect. Appreciate it. And, and thanks very much for having me on. I'm looking forward to it now. Listen, I've had a, a tough weekend. Um, I was reading your book over the weekend and I have to say, um, you know, I have to be vulnerable with you. Uh, I don't think I've ever cried as much as I cried uh, uh, reading your book. Um, and I was just explaining to the lads coming on here that um, I, I think I'm in a sensitive spot uh, because I was reading uh, your book. Um, you know, they were asking me, have um you know has this whole experience for me been positive uh, uh, or negative and overall it's been positive but it's difficult when you have to look at yourself and others um through the prism of you know mental illness and there were parts of your book certainly that um they cut very deep you know they they reminded me of particular moments of uh, my life and you know there were you know particular actions that brought back memories specifically you, you talk a lot about having your head in your hands and there were moments where you you were building up the courage to tell people and all of that is oh, oh so familiar so i want to say to you i you know i wish um i wish i could have seen you in person 
um, you know, I, I, I would love to give you a hug, to be honest with you, um, because I feel like you and I are, are, are kindred spirits in, in a way, you know, we both went through this young, we both had, you know, eyes on us for different reasons, and we both had responsibility, um, and I really hope that this conversation is, is more of a back and forth than, than an interview, because I think we can kind of take a lot um, f- from each other. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I really appreciate the depth you went into um, and the candor with which you you, you spoke about uh, your experiences. Uh, so there's there's two ways this could go. I could completely fuck this up and uh, you know, probably start <laughs> crying in the middle of it, or we could have a great, great chat. So, um, you know, forgive me if, if, if I fuck it up. But we, we always like to start off with a simple question. Um, not always, actually. It's only been the last two recordings. But I want to start off every episode with, with a, a question that Noel asks me at the start of every session we have together. Um, and everyone has a default answer to this. Mm-hmm. You know, mine is usually um, busy or grand. Um, but how are you at the moment, Shane? I love that question because it's a question that I always ask people as well. And you always get that age old kind of Irish comeback of Ashram Grant. You know, you never get the full picture. And I guess yeah. to answer your question, um, I'm overwhelmed at the minute being entirely honest um, in both a good good and bad way I, I think at the minute I've taken on a lot uh, I've had to kind of reevaluate things if I'm being honest over the last number of months um, and I said both in a positive and negative light in terms of I probably took on too much uh, too early on and I was maybe I, I was maybe kind of affecting my own mental health um, in the kind of context of I wanted to help so many others that I wasn't actually looking after myself if that makes sense um, that, you know, I've, I've released a book, I want to help so many, but then I kind of forgot about the person that is me, you know, number one. Um, so from, from, yeah. from that point of view, I'm, I'm good in an overall context, but I'm overwhelmed. Um, but the beauty of it is that I'm working on it. Um, I don't have to hide it anymore. As, uh, as you've read in the book, those years of going through inner turmoil was, was something I never want to do again. And I'm so proud that. I've been able to kind of stand up now over these last number of months um, as it has been quite overwhelming to to say, look, I need to take a step back here. I need to re- reevaluate things and, and have a different thought process kind of going forward. So um, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm really glad you answered a question like that. Like, it, it, <laughs> does, does it feel different to you? Um, and Noel, Noel persistently asks me this now because mm-hmm. I, you know, today I'm able to say to him that I feel like the the initial signs of maybe an episode are kind of coming around and, you know, this isn't down to you, but, you know, your book brought back a lot of, of memories. Um, so I'm able to say like, I, I, the early signs are there. I feel like the, I don't know how it manifests for you, but I get this kind of, um, numbness around my temples, Mm -hmm. um, and I get this kind of tingling in my skin. Um, and I normally, you know, old scripts would have been, you know, shut the fuck up, Chris, get back to work, you know, you're fine, you know, don't worry about it, everyone has bad days, get on with it, you know, get to work, you got too much responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, But now I'm able to kind of say, no, you need to build in a bit of respite here, you need a bit of self-care or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does it feel different for you now when when someone asks you to like describe your emotions or how you feel inside? Do you feel like you've like built something up to be able to answer that question? Because I don't think a lot of people can answer that question properly. Yeah, and, and, and I think the thing is when, you know, back, say, in St. Pat's, when I would, began to learn about this, began to answer the question truthfully, um, as opposed to giving the age all Irish saying, um, I found on the other side that stigmatized light that so many people see mental health in is like, oh, God, I, I probably shouldn't have asked this question. He's actually telling me how he actually is. It's like, well, don't ask the question if you don't want something on his back. That's the way I think about it. And in a strange way, um, I, I keep on doing it because I want people to feel uncomfortable and then get to that point of feeling comfortable being uncomfortable if that makes sense um, and yeah, that's totally you, you know it, from that point of view even when my friends had asked me the first time i came out of st pat's and years after that beautiful kind of thing of being able to actually go lads i am stressed i'm I, i'm up the walls here with work college relationships whatever it may be and to have that ease of conversation now was so so good and being exposed to that in st pat's was the first time that i had seen I was on the other side. I was asking, oh, how are you? And people were like, I'm, I'm not very good at suicide attempts two weeks ago. And I'm kind of like, oh, oh God. You know, that, that, w- that was my stigmatized life that I held, held mental yeah. health in. Um, and the honesty of conversation that I have now compared to back then 
is uh, is a big big contrast and something I'm trying to kind of keep pushing with with other people who maybe haven't gone th- gone through similar things but maybe want to speak out a bit more than they they usually do I would say yeah I, th- I think we fear discomfort Shane you know mm-hmm. I think that um I certainly um you know have been reticent about uh, the illness in the past with people I know mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the big differences between me and you that I got from the book was you kind of brought people on the journey with you. Yeah. I kind of didn't, you know, um, a lot of the things I say on here are first time people hear it. So, um, you know, I, I sometimes I fear for people's reaction um, to what you're going to say. But I, I think that human beings just don't like to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we kind of seek comfort in the path of least resistance. And when you what well, just like you said there, you kind of put people off off kilter a little bit Mm -hmm. um and you're the more you do it the more common it becomes so like if you start with your social circle and go like yeah i'm feeling a bit low today or whatever and people start reciprocating and responding to you Mm -hmm. then that's your social circle that has the kind of a ripple effect you know they can go out and do the same thing um and you won't know what effect you've had on people Mm -hmm. um you know until you hear it from a third party or someone that listened to you on a show or, or, or whatever but I like. I think that was a, a, it's a great exposition of how two two people who have gone through it, and unfortunately, the only people I know who are able to answer this question are people who are close to people who've gone through something like yeah. you have gone through, or um, people who have gone through it themselves. Um, and I know your aspiration is very similar to mine that um, people who are well will start thinking like this. Um, you know, you, you know, catch it before it bolts, basically. Mm. Uh, but we we like to go back to. Um, I think childhood, you know, this is the whole psychoanalytic idea, you know, there's etiology, this idea of cause and effect. And, and you know, we don't want to go and put a simple narrative on, on your childhood that affected your teens, that affected your adulthood. But mm-hmm. um, Noel always likes to tell me that I didn't lick things off a stone. So there are there are certain characteristics that um, you and I both have that we got from our parents or our peers or our, what we were involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think... Uh, from a very young age, it's fair to say, Shane, that you were a bit of a prodigious talent. Um, you know, it, it mentions in the book there that anything you really put your hand to, um, you turned to gold uh, or you won. You know, you were classified as a, a winner from very early on. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that feeling or, or, or how people saw you back then? Yeah, and it was, it was exactly that point of I didn't lick it off a stone. I I was brought into a sport and mad family. Um, I think from my particular characteristics from a young age it was very much kind of similar to my dad and um, you know i'd seen how hard work my dad was and um, and that kind of thing of anything you do you do to your best of your ability no matter be it sport and um, you know relationships work and um, you know school as it were back in back in those days um, and in particular sport that kind of hard graft that kind of hard grit my dad was born in the inner city um struggling his way through dropped out of school at 13 just to fend for for uh for his mother and you know just to kind of keep things going and very much was a man of that kind of era of you know i'm gonna put the bread on the table i'm, I'm gonna do everything i can for my family and um, and i think i was ingrained so early on uh, as he spoke about that kind of relative talent in sport and um, that was uh manifesting very very early on and it was so strange i, I, I say to be honest with you when i think about it like 10 11 8 10 11 years of age i should say you know, I had things like that probably a 10 or 11 year old wasn't ingrained in their mind in terms of, you know, envisaging this kind of success. And um, that was lucky enough to come so early at 17 or 18 in front of 82 and a half thousand people in, in, in Crow Park. So it was quite strange, but it was I very much knew from the outset that I was maybe a bit different. I didn't want to be different. I just wanted to fit in. And um, I was seen as this, as you say, prestigious talent. And I was happy enough that I was seen as that, but I didn't want everything that came thereafter, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you you think you at the time were like, I don't want this. Like there's a specific point in the book. uh, I think you were 12 and you you represented Dublin. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit in the book where you say you came back to class and, you know, they they started calling you the Dublin footballer. Um, And your identity kind of changed. Uh, You became this idea that people latched onto. Do Do you remember thinking like, what the fuck are these people calling me? Dublin footballer did you wear it well or were you cognizant of the time that like I'm changing I didn't wear it well if, if I'm being entirely honest I, I didn't wear it well I at the start I found it a bit strange that people were introducing me to 
other people or just, you know, um, will come over to me and say, Shane, the Dublin footballer. Um, although I, I was so wet behind the ears back then, I didn't realize that I just wanted to be known as Shane the person, but I certainly didn't want to be seen as Shane the Dublin footballer. Yes, I was proud of what I was achieving from a very early age. Um, and I won't shy away from that fact. It was it was nice knowing that I was liked amongst my peers. Everyone kind of craves that kind of popularity, and I was lucky to have that. But at the same token, then I just wanted to be left to my own devices. Um, when I was out in that pitch working hard, and I wanted that as one life, and then my outside life, I just wanted to be known as just just one of the lads. Um, and that just wasn't the case. Not true, no fault of anyone's. It was just because of of course yeah. people are so proud of me. I guess it's culture, isn't it? Um, you know, people people like you know, idolatry is important in society mm-hmm. for social dynamics. People like to have someone to look up to. You know, uh, there have been studies and and where they put kids together and ask them to play, and even children at a very very young age developing seem to um they look at a particular person as like the alpha or or, mm-hmm. or whatever in in the group. We we can't really help it. Um, it just seems to happen and. I remember growing up and there were kids in, you know, our town, I'm from West Cork, a town called Bandon, that were, you know, just shit hot, you know, everything they fucking did was, they were class at, you know, mm-hmm. they were the, the, the best hurlers in the town or the best footballers or the best rugby players. And when you're young, right, you're 12 or you're um, a young teenager or right, right away, to be honest, till adulthood, mm-hmm. um, there are a couple of things you want to be good at. Mm-hmm. that are going to get you good social standing. Yeah. Right. You want to either be good looking, you know, I'm not afraid to say it, Shane, you're a good looking lad, <laughs> right? You want to be good at sport. You were good at sport. You were playing for Dublin from, from the time you were 12, or you want to be good with women. And I'm sure, um, you know, you're probably not going to admit this, but there are plenty of women because of the things you're good at and because of your looks. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, from a lad's perspective, at the very least, um, you know, you were kind of, the dawn from early on, I can only assume I wasn't here. I didn't grow up in, in, in Dublin, but I knew in my town that, uh, you know, the lads who were good at sport very early on, the lads who were playing, you know, inter pros for, for Munster and, and, you know, um, I had a friend who played for Ireland in hockey and, you know, I was never really naturally, sorry, I don't believe in natural talent, but I was never someone who applied myself to sport early on. Mm-hmm. So I'd look at these people as, um, better than me, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that you didn't really want the kind of title of, of uh, he's the Dublin footballer, he's better than us. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very interesting to hear you say that actually. And there's something that I think we both have in common. Um, I didn't know this, it wasn't in the book, but your dad leaving school when he, when he was 13, my, my dad did the same thing when he was 13 or 14. Um, and that idea of anything you do, do it to your best ability yeah. is a mantra right and I, I you say it it rolls off your tongue as if like it's at the forefront of your mind for every second of every day mm-hmm. and i i have be a leader not a follower and this is what my father used to um i was telling Noel that I have, I have specific memories of car journeys and times when we would discuss um you know how to act with your peers or how to act in certain situations mm-hmm. and it was to be a leader to demonstrate uh leadership capabilities or you know when when your friends are in trouble you are you need to be the one that um uh, you know, can stand up, you know, mm-hmm. you need to be the person that, uh, if people are making fun of other kids, you need to say to them, you know, you don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to be, be the person that, um, if you're different or if someone's different, you need to kind of shine a light on that in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you think like that mantra, um, is still with you now? Do you, do you think that was something that that kind of pervaded, uh, your, your life? Was it an aspect of everything you did? I think from early on it did um you know you spoke about that kind of social dynamic of i was maybe pigeonholed into from a very early age this alpha male uh, as you say this kind of all dominant leader of the group and because i didn't have my faculties about me of thinking okay no no hold on what who do i want to be you know i didn't have any of that so i just found myself okay i'm in this category here this is who i am and this is who i need to act um around this kind of group And and i guess even from that point of view of you spoke about kind of, you know, I had things going for me in terms of sporting kind of worlds and, you know, popular popularity amongst friends and that kind of uh, female attention that I didn't know whether it was there or I just didn't seek it. And, and if I'm being honest, I, I was probably that was one thing that the lads got got at me for because I had no interest. I was like, 
did it play football did it play sports no not not interested you know and i think as well like from an early age as as the kind of you know any young kid do is as experimental in their ways in terms of drinking smoking all other stuff i just wasn't interested in that and you know after kind of summer exams people getting their hands on all sorts of ids and whatever else they can to get any amount of drink that they can i was up in the gar club with my dad and and i was just different and i guess people had seen that as i was possibly a bit I, I, I was called weird. So I was called a freak uh, from people who are probably more jealous of what I was trying to achieve from an earlier, early age. Sure. Um, and, and that was, the, that was the reality of it. It wasn't, it was maybe soft bullying because I didn't particular care, particularly care about what they were doing. I'd seen as like, you're wasting your life there. And that's where the maturity in my age of 13, 14, 15, I already had that kind of, you know, thought process in my head that these people aren't going anywhere. They're not going to make anything of themselves that I don't care if they want to dump all their issues on me because I want to go out and achieve something different to what society probably seems normal, what young kids should be doing. Um, and it's interesting there, you touched upon even your dad and everything like that, there's conversations in the car and I'd be kind of very, very kind of clued into like even his phone calls and all that when he's speaking to people and just how we kind of approach situations. It was very much that in terms of, okay, what's the process here? How do we get to a step? in terms of getting to excellence how do we get to 100 percent, and all that as in like there was no stone left unturned and i think mm. that was ingrained in me inadvertently it was either direct conversations that he had with me or it was indirect conversations that i was listening into and that was constantly kind of manifesting in my kind of i would say self in terms of that striving for excellence and that kind of wanting to be the best that i can be every single day um and the, the lads that you know had slagged me say will you take a day off? Will you slow down? Like, and yeah. I just didn't want any of that. I was just like, lads, I, I, I have no interest in doing whatever you're doing, you know? And that's where I was kind of finding myself as well. And probably inadvertently that kind of pressurized environment that we feel like we need to be someone. I was becoming more and more comfortable as I was getting older and being who I, who I am and who I wanted to be, I guess. And um, even though people had seen this as quote unquote freaky or, or weird. Yeah. I was called boring. My friends call me father stone. You know, um, from uh, <laughs> Craggy Island, yeah. So, yeah. like, it, it, you know, I wasn't um, applying myself to anything particular. I have a very obsessive <laughs> nature, um, maybe even obsessive compulsiveness, mm. and uh, I would apply myself to things rigorously, whether that be exams. I always remember I was getting grinds from a science teacher, and uh, he was kind of uh, bemused at the fact my mom told him that I had fallen asleep at my desk. Um, the night before really late studying you know because i i always remember i don't i didn't think i was conscious of it at the time but because my father was you know um not really around like he was working um, you know he, he would work 100 hour weeks consistently um so it was this idea for me of hard work mm -hmm. you know this this you know freud is this idea of the golden seed and it's it's you know the, the provenance of or, or where this kind of seedling idea came from um of hard work and uh, you know something i thought was interesting in in the book was this idea of sacrifice mm -hmm. that you learned from a young age you know you you associated um the effort you put in and the sacrifices that you made outside of the sport with your success in the sport mm -hmm. maybe if you had been more carefree and you had like chilled with the lads and you know smoked weed behind the fucking shed in school like everyone else was doing yeah um you still might have been like a dublin footballer but you didn't you associated you know the cause uh being my hard work and my sacrifice with the effect being i'm getting medals and trophies here and i make it onto the dublin panel therefore it just amplifies as as your life went on and i i do, do you think that at the time when you were you were a young guy right um, you know, you're 14, 15, 16, and even younger. Do you remember thinking I am sacrificing for the, for the greater good here or the goal? Yeah, I, de I definitely did. And that was a thing that I guess from a very early age, I knew what I wanted to do, what I wanted to achieve and what I needed to do in terms of that sacrifice of that little thing of like not smoking weed with the lads behind the shelters or not going out for drinks at the weekend or not ha like the little thing of like not having a Chinese or not having a chocolate bar and all this. You probably, you, you could say as well, it was probably too regimented, too military-like. Um, mm. 
but I loved every minute of it in, in such a strange way that people had seen an issue with it from my outside kind of circle and people had seen like why why are you doing that like how can you enjoy that I was like well I really really enjoy this as in like I'd much rather go for a run or go for a kick with my dad or do a cycle do a swim rather than sit around on the beach drinking endless amount of cans as in that just didn't appeal to me um, and I guess that was difficult at the start for people to kind of realize um, because again that social dynamic of we need to fit in here um, and, and that was the thing of I was fitting into my life I was fitting into my circle and it was definitely something that um, I knew I was sacrificing but for the greater good because I knew things were coming good uh, things were going to come good and continue to be like that so I had no issue in terms of worrying what other people would say or think as I developed through the years, I guess. Yeah, there's, uh, I always remember growing up, uh, yeah, I played a little bit of the J um, on and off until I was maybe 14 and I went into golf and, and, and then people started playing rugby. Mm. So I played rugby, you play with your friends are playing mostly. Like you know, I had no real drive to be an a, a, a excel in any sport um i wanted to be a rugby player i guess but i you know i didn't know what it took at the time mm. the, the level of sacrifice that you understood from that age um but do you think in in the gaa because i we i discussed this a lot i did a um, sports studies and physical ed- education physical education degree in in university college cork and um we'd spend a lot of time together you know the rugby lads and the ga lads and whatever and we'd we'd jokingly deride each other uh, all the time you know mm-hmm. Um, and one of the aspects I found fascinating about the GAA was this idea of like sacrifice is quite ingrained in, in club, um, <coughs> sport, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, you know, there was two things that the GAA players loved fucking doing running laps and, um, you know, sacrificing and like, we'd make jokes with them about like, you know, you, you can't do this and you can't do that before a match. And they all had these kind of, um, they all had these superstitions, um, you know, that were their lucky um, jocks before the game or on the day of the game and this kind of stuff. And rugby players don't have that um, to, to, a, to a large extent. Am, am I way off the mark there or, or is that right? No, absolutely. And just as you're saying that in terms of the different kind of sport and worlds and how it kind of clash and had different kind of um, opinions on how sacrifice should look like. Um, I even have a story there a couple of years ago, one of my best mates, um, had uh, who I played growing up with Gaelic soccer hurling absolutely everything I'd went down a Gaelic football route he went down a soccer route and he'd moved over to England and um, I think it was maybe 16 17 years of age and we'd always kept in touch and he'd come back after I think maybe five or six years of um, spending a bit of time over there and he'd signed for a club up up north um, and he was living in Port Marnock he just lives up the way from me and um, he was saying oh we'll, we'll go for a drink this weekend it's like no, no, I won't be drinking till October. And I think this was maybe January, February. And he was like, what? It's like, are you serious? He goes, I, I, I thought the one the lads was messing to me. He was talking to another Gaelic footballer up in, up in Tyrone, as it were. And he was the exact same, this kind of thing of no, no, no drink. We always train hard, run loads of laps, all this kind of stuff yeah. for nine, 10 months of the year. Don't touch a drink. I was like that. I, and he goes, he goes, how do you diffuse? Listen, how do you relax? Isn't like, Shane, I, I'm a professional footballer here. And we're told to go out, you know, when the time is yeah. right. We're told to go out every week or second week or when the time is right, you know, to diffuse, have a couple of drinks, have a bit of crack and just get away from that kind of 110% kind of commitment to the cause. Um, and he certainly yeah. changed my perspective on that. Um, it's interesting you say from the rugby kind of context, it was saying from the soccer, like rugby, of course, a massive drinking culture. You know, yeah, Gaelic absolutely. football is nearly like frowned upon that you had a drink a month before a game you, you know yeah um, and he's it's culturally significant i think in the ga like, like mm. what i find interesting is the 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 guy i call it guy ga lads i grew up with um would be almost ascetic um they, they would they would like rid themselves of all kind of um you know anything that would be seen as um bad for their health yeah. or bad for their game or they would become almost religious about it for the season like when it was coming up the championship or champo um like you wouldn't see the lads no but then when the minute they get knocked out of championship or they win or whatever weeks and we they were fucking they go mental you know on the drink yeah um and it was just like it's funny that like rugby sometimes they say like you've a, a drinking team with a rugby problem you know because rugby has always been classically associated with, associated with like after the game you have uh, a few jars mm. Um, that doesn't seem to be a thing in, in the GA. And I, I thought it was interesting that like, you know, sacrifice, hard work and all that kind of stuff was talked about so much in your story, but 
you had it you know coming from um your your closest loved ones you had it in your sport you know you, all these feedback loops were going on and you was as you were growing up that like i know you say you you enjoyed the process mm. of um you know the hard work and, and and whatever but you know there's an argument to say you also enjoyed or you could have also enjoyed the the benefits and the wins that it was giving you you know this mm-hmm. is how feedback loops work like if i do something and i realize that oh i won therefore i'll do it again and then it just keeps amplifying and amplifying and amplifying and amplifying all of a sudden like you're getting to senior level and you know um you know the coach is telling you you need to work hard and your version of work hard manifests in a certain way mm-hmm. your version of work hard is i'm going to do this this and this and this this is my like regime that i've done since i was you know nine years old or whatever yeah and the other lad could be like completely different you know he could be the lad who's talking about his you know working hard for me is making sure my lucky jocks are washed (laughs) washed before the game you know yeah yeah um but i i i think that it's important that we we understand that you know but i don't want to belabor on on uh, on you know your your childhood too long Mm -hmm. um because i think there there's a lot to be said um from the point where you're maybe 17 um, onwards because this is where um you you start referring to your you don't think you knew it was depression at the time but mm-hmm. um your early signs of depression and mm-hmm. um, can, you, can you take me to perhaps midway through fifth year and um how you first started to um let's say perceive or, or to notice changes in yourself what were the other symptoms that were, were were cropping up i guess the symptoms were when i look back um in particular um i would say the thing that gave me the most joy was of course probably comes as no surprise as football Um, i was training five six times a week there were particular matches um you know whether it be like an away match going down the bus with the lads playing against cork or Kerry or going up to donegal and all this sort of stuff and at the beginning for me i thought it was hormonal changes and i thought it was something that was going on in my body that i was like okay i'll try to figure this out it was very sporadic maybe at the start it was maybe once or twice a month and i didn't take any heed of it um one i didn't want to and then two um i just thought i'd get over it um and then i slowly started noticing in the middle of fifth year that it was becoming more and more apparent that the low was feeling a lot more low than the last low um and it just felt like a bit of a weight that was building up and building up and building up and i was thinking okay i'm not going to speak up here because building that kind of childhood picture that I am this pedestal-like figure. I'm this guy living this idyllic life and I can't show any sign of weakness. I'm the alpha male here. I'm the leader. So the last thing in my head was I'm going to speak up. I'm going to say something to someone. Um, I was so uneducated around mental health, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, anything like that. It simply wasn't spoken about. Um, mm-hmm. as, as we all know, in terms of society back then, 10 years ago, it's completely different to where we are today. And yet we still have a long way to go today. Um, but particularly in the middle of fifth year, those kind of things of matches to look forward to, I couldn't quite attack today. I'd get up and I'd be feeling, why can't I look forward to this? Like, what, what's, what is going on? And the only time that I felt happy was when I was actually then out on that pitch and I was masking it. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I'd feel it again a couple of weeks later. And then it would be a week and then it'd be day after day after day. Um, and it was just a spiral effect like that, I would say. It's that sense of joylessness i think you know um that i don't think people who uh, have not experienced depression understand how uh, pessimistic and uh, joyless i think you can become mm-hmm. even early on uh, i think back in my symptoms it was that same thing of i didn't know what the hell was going on you know i didn't think it was hormonal changes because i was 19 or, or 20 mm-hmm. i just I actually had come back from um, traveling in New Zealand into um, university and I just wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't like it there. And I remember anticipating in in sixth year um, going to university like this kind of, I had this like idea of like California college, you know, like fucking going and drinking out of red cups and the parties or whatever. (laughs) And then when I got back, it was cold and dreary and I was cold all the fucking time. And, um, you know, we had to get the classes and I kept missing classes because I was just being lazy and it just kind of spiraled that way, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do do you remember like actual symptoms? Do do was there, was it just low mood at that time or were there other things like, did, 
did, was there things that you stopped doing? Mm-hmm. A lot of time for me it was I stopped doing things that were good for me. Yeah, just just a side note there, California, what a place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll probably touch upon that later. But my God, that just brought back so many happy memories there. <laughs> but um, yeah, to go to go back to your point, I I guess that kind of you would say I did. I think you touched upon it there earlier on about that kind of numbness, that lack of emotion that you could attach to absolutely anything. Um, that was certainly apparent very early on. Um, that kind of thing of looking, okay, look, it's going to be so fantastic. I'm going to be putting on the Dublin jersey, something I've wanted to do so many times over. And I couldn't feel anything. I was looking at the image. I was playing out these happy moments that should have been happy moments. And I was just met with a numbness. It was just met with such a lack of emotion. And for me, it was quite the opposite, actually. It was me that wanted to keep doing things. I wanted to keep going, wanted to keep you know, training every single day, five, six times a week. And that was my only outlet. That was my only way of feeling somewhat happy or feeling somewhat elated um, for a couple of hours at least. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to do, and I know it's actually quite the opposite and not a common thing with, with depression. It's quite often people are feeling low. They don't want to go up and attack the day. But I knew that was going to be warning signs for people because I was so busy in my life. If I had started taking myself away from places or things or matches or trainings then the question would be asked and that was the very very last thing I wanted to do so if anything it actually made me double up on my energy and outputs and just make sure I was constantly busy doing it sport work you know social kind of aspects or whatever it may be I have had to keep up appearances so the questions weren't going to be coming from the other side then sorry just as, as both of you are talking it's it's and it's not this isn't about kind of oh let's tell our war stories but I think a big part of this whole thing that we're wanting to, that we want to do with podcasts and by having people on is that there's something will relate to someone some sit someone's situation you know mm-hmm. and things like that and like say for my own thing Jane will know this up the the, the um, maybe the international listeners may not but it, the sentiment is, it, the principle is is definitely there um. I think it was 2007. I was, I would have, I played uh, hurling, which is also a GAA sport. Shane, I'm sure Shane didn't know it well. Um, and I was on a, on a regional team doing really well, really enjoying it. 2007. And I were up at this club called Thomas Davis there. You know, they're all weather pitch oh, up yeah. there, Shane. Coming off it and just absolutely buzzing, loving it. 30 lads just out like, loving hurling and that. But then, whatever happened to me and uh, the diff- my depression going to kicking in exactly a year later coming out i remember i always remember walking off the same pitch coming around the back of the car park getting into the car because i used to park at the far side so your 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 car window didn't get smashed if the ball went over the net <laughs> um tactical par- car parking <laughs> and getting to the car and, and just the, it's literally the width so the width of a, of, a, of a ga pitch is about 60 meters there thereabouts and it took me the width of a pitch from coming to absolute ecstatic excitement buzzing to depression and mm-hmm. to conf- and the confusion that it was just oh what what's going on where where oh what's what's this kind of confusion and that and I suppose that that's it, it brings those things up back up for me but it's obviously been through what I've been through and then you know learning what I've learned since since that it, it's fantastic but it's I suppose it's to come back to you in that moment and what was again I suppose it, just to touch on it again but what was did you feel a panic did you feel an overwhelm was it because for me it was like just this darkness just absolutely came back over me just totally took the soul of any ounce of enjoyment out of it because mm-hmm. what was that like for you and those did, did you have those particular moments where it was like a, a switch almost yeah, and, and, and I completely relate to you in, ter- in terms of the, again, outside looking in, you p- possibly may have well played an absolutely fantastic match and people thinking oh, that's, uh, that, that, mm. that's great what's going on in, in that player's life over there. Like there's nothing wrong with him, et cetera, et cetera. And then 60 meters later, literally 60 meters mm. later, yeah, your world is turned upside down and your emotions have, are, you know, completely changed. Um, and that's how quickly it can happen. And that happened to me so many times where I was nearly wanting to go, Okay, I need to go back out on the pitch. I need to go back out for a run. And I've done that sometimes. I, I even remember, I can relate to that completely on the way back from, we were training up in, um, in Bal Griffin, which is about maybe five minutes from my house. Um, and yeah. come home after a tough session. Um, and I think it was between the car journey from Bal Griffin back to home, I just felt like a complete low. I was just like, 
I'm back in my own head. I'm back into the person that I don't want to be because I was living two lives. I was that happy person out on the pitch, everything going well for me. And then the other side, this depressive figure that didn't want any part of the world come the come the end of the two years of what I went through. Um, and I just took my bike out and I went out. I think it was two, two and a half hours on the bike and I just cycled, just kept on cycling as hard as I could just to try to get those endorphins going again on my body so I didn't think what I was thinking back in the car um, from coming home from training. And it's so debilitating because that's even from a, a sporting standpoint, that's absolutely not the thing you should be doing after coming off a training session to be willing to then go onto a bike for two and a half hours and I, it was then jeopardizing as well. I had actually probably inadvertently kind of added more guilt to myself because I came back and I was like, I'm not going to, that's going to take me an extra couple of days to recover from that. As in like, that was such a tough training session alone that I've inadvertently may have jeopardized my performance level on the pitch for this weekend because I've stupidly went out and, you know, that spiral of negative emotion yet again that you just can't keep control of. A guilt is awful. Mm-hmm. Like that, it, it's... You know, in Buddhism, they have this idea of, of the um, two darts. You know, the first dart is your perception of the situation or your, or your anxiety. And then you know, the second dart may never come. It's the actual event, event itself. And it, it's mm. so tiring. Uh, but when I hear you talk like that, Jane, I'm trying to imagine um, what your peers were thinking. Like, here's Shane Carty, you know, Dublin footballer. And after a match, he goes for a fucking two hour cycle. He's so disciplined. Yeah. The man is so disciplined, you know. Um and I, I I thought it was kind of poignant in the book when you started talking about like your absenteeism. So you, you, you'd you tell your buddies uh, that I can't make it out tonight, um, you know, just uh, have a match at the weekend, you know, mm-hmm. need to refuel, just went for a two hour cycle after the match. So I need to rest the legs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like it was very easy for you um, to to tell everyone that you couldn't do this or you couldn't do that or you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be there because they all thought you were just being a disciplined warrior, you know, mm-hmm. the guy preparing his craft for for the game day on Saturday or whatever. And everyone, you know, doesn't matter who you are, whether it was your parents or, you know, uh, Jack off the street, they looked at you as someone who was like disciplined. Because mm-hmm. I can just, I'm thinking back to like how I look at people um, and I would have thought like, oh, that, that's our idea of like peak performance. You know, like these people mm-hmm. who are like, they're willing to go the extra mile. Am I am I right there? Like, did people just continually call you disciplined? And in your in your heart, you were like, "Well, if only you knew why I wasn't there." Yeah, and that's exactly what it was because the signs and symptoms that I was showing, you know, for for me when I say to people, "What should you look out for?" is that withdrawn kind of nature from a group and constantly kind of canceling on events or things. But it was an easier excuse for me because it was. I would say plausible because exactly that where I could easily just fob it off of, you know, I just need to rest up here. I need to recover. I had a tough cycle. I had a tough training session, whatever it may be. And it was that guilt of the repression of my own identity because I wanted to be amongst the lads. I wanted to be amongst, you know, the, the laugh and the joke and, you know, relaxing before a big game or training. But I just felt like I was in situations when I went in, I was like, shit, I, I wish I didn't go into this. I wish I didn't put myself into this because I was there physically mentally my head was elsewhere and it was that i think i spoke about it in the book of you know imagining that you have headphones on and you're playing a, a song as loud as you can and then you drop it down you you cut off the music and then you're back into the conversation and then you put the music back up again and it was just constant back and forth back and forth and that frightened me to the core because i was thinking these are, these lads are going to pick up on this they're going to know exactly what's going on and it's that kind of frightening aspect of this is just not me like what is going on um, and that was the confusion because I'd withdrawn from the group and I was at home and I had different excuses, whatever it may be. And I was sat there trying to figure it out. And all the while I was trying to figure it out, it was just manifesting into something worse and worse and worse because the fact of the matter is I didn't have anyone to lean on. I didn't have anyone to lean on in the aspect of mental health. It simply, yeah. if it was, it was very hush hush. You know, you don't speak about it. There was nothing like this, the likes of podcasts or or kind of people doing public speaking events or, you know, just even a book about mental health, you know, that simply wasn't a fact. So my kind of thought was I'm the only one in the world going through this um, and I'm just different. I don't want to be part of this world the way I'm thinking. Um, and that was unfortunately where my head was taking me day after day, time after time. I cancel on events with friends or family or whatever the situation that I found myself in. 
Do you like to have anyone ever referred to your depression as high functioning? No, in in terms of like I I would consider what I have to be high functioning in that I can um act like a person who doesn't have depression. Mm-hmm. Um, I can do things that other people who are quote unquote successful do and I can put in the hours and all this kind of stuff and I can put on the charade mm-hmm. but um I have depression. Okay. Yeah. So some people who are clinically diagnosed they they can't do certain things. It's so it's so um it's so heavy for them that they can't go to work and they can't go to the training or physically their body just won't allow them. Yeah. My body seems to allow me but it is um it's exhausting and mm-hmm. what i'll say is that it, it it gives you a different sense of guilt um and I'm, I'm wondering did you feel the same guilt and the guilt that i feel is i have everything that um i once wanted okay mm-hmm. uh, maybe i don't want it anymore i have what other people want uh, people are telling me that I'm good at things and people are, are patting me on the back and, you know, commandeering and, and all sorts of great stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? So from the outside, people are saying like, you know, you've got it great, you know, you're living a dream, you're doing what you want. And on the inside, I'm kind of torn up because I'm like, oh, I can't really tell you that I fucking hate this. And, you know, I feel terrible uh, because I'm kind of letting you down, no? Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm, I'm, you have this expectation of me that I know that I can't keep up forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I tell you, I'm going to let you down. Mm-hmm. Did, did you feel guilty about it? Yeah, I, I certainly think, and, and I think actually um, you'd mentioned it earlier on in terms of it was difficult maybe for you to tell those who were closest to you. Um, yeah. And I completely get that because those who are closest to you, you feel like you don't want to burden them. You feel like exactly that. You don't want to let them down with this devastating news that you're not the person that you know you're acting upon um, and that acting performance you know I very much seen it as and I actually contrasted it to I was on this is going off on a very different tangent here I was on um, the Elaine show uh, not too long ago back in 2019 and Eric Lawler um, uh, a comedian was um, was on the show and we we're getting counted down we we're having a bit of a laugh and you know he's been himself and, and chatting away in different bits and pieces and it was basically counting down three, two, one, and the laughing, joking figure that was three seconds ago was just completely deadpan and like the acting performance that he was going to put on for the show and the cameras. That's what I felt like when I was driving to training. I was trying to compose myself, I was trying to relax, trying to mm. get a bit of respite from the the inner demons that were going deep within along that journey. And then once I opened that door, it was like lights, camera, action. Okay, let's put on an acting performance in your life yet again. And that was the thing after day after day. And it was the guilt of it because even when I went home, it wasn't as if I could just diffuse. It was like, right, I could, you know, I can diffuse here. I was hiding from people who are, you know, under the same roof as me. Um, sure. And the only time that I could really kind of be myself or kind of like let a big kind of deep exhalation of, uh, of breath was that, you know, when I was in my room, when I closed my door, that I was like, okay, I'm in my own world here i am the person that i am and i don't know if you've ever ever read the the book chin paradox by no, professor no. steve peters it was he basically the book kind of speaks about the kind of two voices going on in your head and essentially the two lives that people live who are going through mental health difficulties the one life that you want people to see and then the other life that is actually the the reality of who you are um and the mm. kind of constant repression of of your own identity and how that can affect um not only yourself but people around you because it's essentially yes. like a ticking time bomb. It's a ticking time bomb. It's like a volcano ready to erupt. Um, and it took me two years uh, to erupt because, as, as you coined it there, that kind of high-functioning person that I was, um, you know, I was constantly busy. I was constantly wanting to do things to make sure people weren't going to ask those questions. And inadvertently, then, it was just adding even more and more pressure because my life was going on an upper curve. And yet, on the opposite end, my life was completely spiraling it was going it was going completely the opposite way and that was more and more difficult as it went on what were you actually afraid of i was afraid of the unknown the fear of the unknown i would say because as i said i had nothing to base what i was thinking or what i was feeling or how i was essentially acting 
um, to anything else or anyone else. You know, you see, you know, you break a leg, you see, okay, I need to get crutches, I need to get a cast on, I need a certain set of, you know, uh, medications or a rehab and different bits and pieces. You see a path, you see a process, you see how to get out the other side. I simply didn't have that. So I, my fear was number one of the unknown and then number two, the fear of judgment. That exact thing of those closest to me thinking that, you know, what, why are you telling us this? How, how would you be feeling this way? You're, you're simply not feeling this way. You know, you're, you're playing in front of 82 and a half thousand people every couple of, every couple of weeks. You're, you know, you're 18 years of age. You're playing the Dublin senior football team. You know, I remember those days of like the morning gym sessions, the 6 a.m. morning gym sessions, which get showered up after the session. I'd be getting into my school uniform. Some of the lads who are teachers would be getting into their work clothes, if you like, and they were like, you could be in my class this afternoon, <laughs> like, you know, and yeah. such was the rarity of situation. So I guess it was the fear of that judgment as well that like, and it was so rational in my thinking because, you know, looking back, you know, what I know now, you know, I, I wish I had spoken up in day one in the middle of fifth year because it was so rational thinking, why are, would my mom or dad or my three sisters and my two best friends laugh at me? They'd simply love me. They want me to be happy in my own life. They want me to see, you know, to see me happy and, and to kind of be functioning my everyday life. But yeah, I was thinking, no, nah, these people are going to think I'm lying. They're going to laugh at me. And that's the irrational thinking that you have. You get off to a pattern of thought and you solely think that is going to be the outcome. So that was the difficulty for me, I would say. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, you know, self-deceit is the most powerful form of life. Mm -hmm. I think. And, um, we do justify these things to ourselves, you know, not telling people will save them from, you know, the sadness of knowing what's actually going on or, um, you know, not telling mm -hmm. the lads will mean that I fit in, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not dragging down the conversation, you know, yeah. I know groups of lads, it's always kind of about the laughs and the jokes and, taking the piss and you know a bit of banter and if you're the guy that's um dragging it down being like oh you know i'm, I'm actually crying um every evening before i go to bed you don't want to be that person i guess you know mm -hmm. um but ultimately you know we all learn i think that when you do tell people they'll tell you their own plight uh, as well mm -hmm. and I, li I like that idea of um you know you, you mentioned that we kind of maintain this perception for people um no one and i have, have I've talked about this at length a lot because I think at the end of 2019, I don't really know what happened to me, but I, I went through this process of um, where I, I felt like I was living a lie. You know, mm -hmm. I had maintained appearances and I think it was the first time I, I kind of identified that in me. And we went through all this stuff where I did a lot of reading around the idea of, of um, congruence from, from Carol Rogers and individuation and from Carol Jung and all of these kind of psychological concepts of essentially becoming a person, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, there's this uh, idea that we kind of, we already are who we want to be, but it's just, we have to kind of take this jagged road to, to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very unfortunate thing for a young man or a young woman to, to go through or have to deal with in, in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think depression is a very pernicious disease. You know, it, it starts off as being, I, you know, I, I have low mood here and there. It's exhausting because you go from that to feeling good. And then, you know, you start uh, feeling this joylessness. Mm -hmm. And I, there was a kind of a process I could see happening in, in your book where it started off you being like, oh, this is just hormonal. It's fine. You know, every time I play sport, I can, I can mask it. And then you, you started self-isolating got into like excessive rumination mm -hmm. where you started like thinking through things perhaps too deeply what are these people thinking of me what would they say if i told them i need to maintain this appearance because if i don't come out of the car before training you know and and you know have a bit of banter with the lads then they'll think there's something wrong with me that's exhausting and then you get this kind of lack of sleep and i knew when the lack of sleep started coming in you were going over the edge that's that's the the point where it starts getting really hard because the one thing you have with sleep is that it, it um, you know, the lymphatic system, it, it cleans out your brain and you, you can feel rested the next day. You may feel shit still, but at least your body is rested. Mm -hmm. you know, your mind may not be. Um, and then eventually, I think it was perhaps six or you need to kind of correct the timelines here, but mm. you started having these suicidal ideations. Yeah. Um, can you, can you perhaps describe, um, what that felt like and how that manifested for you. Yeah, just just even to touch upon your, your earlier point of, of that, of I love the fact that as in like where I try to get people to the point is that 
you've educated yourself tenfold as in around the kind of area of mental health and i love that because the more people know the more people are aware you know we educate ourselves about absolutely everything geography history maths whatever it may be but we don't educate ourselves about our own mind um and and that's where i try to get people around the how can we you know develop as a society how can we kind of develop on from this stigmatized light it's like develop you know your your understanding of mental health you know you can't develop or move on or understand what is going on for you if you aren't educating yourself and reading up and knowing who you are uh within i guess and then to kind of lead on to that i guess from that point of view that uneducated self and me um not knowing from hormonal changes to you know i would say depressive episodes start getting worse and worse and worse and then manifesting into a year and a half through my journey and um, those first kind of thoughts of dying by suicide the internal dialogue and the difficulty with me around that time was six days previous i was in front of eighty-two and a half thousand people with the sam mcguire and um, cast high above my head and yet six days later i didn't want any part of the world um, and it was exactly that point of certainly now how can i say this to anyone you know well, if I thought people were thinking I would be lying before, they certainly would be thinking this now. Um, and it was a hugely scary thought because it was a thought that I didn't want to have. All these thoughts, as I said, that little chimp on my right shoulder was telling me one thing, the chimp on my left shoulder was telling me another. Um, and I just felt like that inner voice, that inner negative voice was getting louder and louder and louder. And that scared me to the core. That scared me to the core. And I'll never forget that day when the first you know, thoughts of dying by suicide came into my head. And it was becoming more and more real. I didn't want to feel that way. I didn't want to think that way. But it was never leaving too far by my side. I felt like as the, as the train was pulling off, it would reverse and come back and back and back. And I was like, no, no, keep going. Keep going that way. Get away from me. But I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of it. That was a huge, scary thought. As I was thinking, I want so deeply to be part of this world. I want to be part of something. I want to be part of a journey. I want to live a long life. But yet, the other part of Shane is saying, no you're better off you end it all here now yeah like i i always remember feeling that like i, I had some suicidal ideations too you know um early on when i was you know 19 20 and at, at different periods of, of my 20s mm. um and I, I think like you i'm perhaps an overthinker and mm. i um, I tend to lean on books and, you know, I started to lean on philosophy and the particular types of philosophy I got into had like these concepts that perhaps I was only dipping into and I was taking them and kind of reimagining them for myself, which, you, should, you know, if you're going to study philosophy, you need to go very deep into to one type to fully understand it. It's very nuanced. Mm. Uh, but I, I felt that like the, wor the world was kind of absurd, you know, it didn't make any sense to me, you know, what's the point? of all these things you know what's the point of making money what's the point of doing anything mm -hmm. um and it, it kind of became progressively more difficult for me uh, but i kept going through these cycles of um depression everyone telling me like you've got depression and you need to sort yourself out mm -hmm. to coming out of it like i'd pull myself out of it um uh, somehow i don't know how mm -hmm. you know it just dissipated and then there would be this process of denial where I kind of forget about it. Like it, like it didn't exist for me. Like it, I couldn't explain to people what it felt like. And, um, you know, I, there was a lot of time I didn't tell people because I felt like it's not worth telling people, mm -hmm. you know, like I haven't, um, uh, you don't use the word commit, by the way. I want to ask you, is that, you're not, you're not supposed to say the word commit, um, suicide. Yeah, it was, it was actually when, when I, um, thankfully, I, I, and, and I was quite humbled that um, Pierre de House had asked me to come, uh, come on board as an, as an ambassador in 2019. Um, I had used that phrase. I, I had used that um, kind of phrase of commit suicide. Um, and uh, they had wanted me to kind of use a different line of die by suicide. Because um, commit, I, I think from their kind of thinking is that you're, it's nearly an offense to, to kind of feel that way or want to act yeah, upon that yeah. way you're right actually um, the, the word commit is a commit crime, a crime to commit, commit a crime it, it's it's talking about that there's more guilt associated with it and it's, yeah it's trying to take that off take that off take that kind of thing away from it mm -hmm. um but it's just something that, that uh, as both of you are talking around and this is something that i try to i suppose get across to people and like that i'd love to get across to that 17 year old to, to that um uh 
uh, 18 year old kid is that when we get these thoughts in our mind and you, t- you touched on it um, a few minutes ago of, of um, you got into that kind of just uh, spiral thinking, you know, the, the way you saw things and it's the, the, what I would lots of therapists would call it, would describe as your filter. So the way you see things. So like mm-hmm. that, if I see the sun is shining outside, but if I've really dark glasses on, it's as if the, the sun who we all know, which we all know is really, really bright. It seems really, really dark. So that's our filter. Mm-hmm. So every fi- like, so your lens that we're, essentially that you're looking at this life through is just a really dark filter so like that mm. i'm looking at it or whoever's standing in, on hill 16 it's like looking at this bright eyed you know maybe with a kind of bear, bear goggles on a little bit as well but if you're in the hill at that stage but there's oh my god there's this kid oh isn't he lucky the luckiest guy in the world but then you look at that if you can imagine like a, a switch in between two cameras and we look through shane's lens and it's just i'd say that like the place could be just dripping with crap and just just horribleness of mm-hmm. like i know what i'm going back to when this is gone and if only they knew mm-hmm. um but then i suppose bringing on so that it's trying to get to talk to that to that kid and when we're in that kind of spiral thinking we just think and if the, these um suicidal ideations or thoughts of harming ourselves or talking th- thoughts of taking our own life i mean we just take that as given and that's the only way and it's it's, it's usually you know overwhelming and and that and i often try to say to people like to try and understand it is that quite often it's there's and you, you touched on it there shane is that yes there's a huge part of you that wants to stay alive and what often happens is if you the way i describe it is if you can imagine in, in your left hand is life and in your right hand is is ending the pain that you're in because you're like mm-hmm. you're in just so much pain mm-hmm. emotional mental physical pain it can manifest itself but unfortunately, what can often happen is when we're in that really dark place, we mash the two together and we think, oh, well, the end, of, the end is pain. I have to end my life. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 trying to get to a point and, and thankfully you got to that point and, and you're spreading the word of that point of it's actually don't mash the two hands together. The best thing to, to end is pain that's in your right hand is by keeping your life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and that's absolutely the, the best way to like that the best way to to end the pain is the key is actually use the life itself but it's it's trying to get those tools obviously and and do give the things you know thereafter you you make that decision and that choice to say no no i'm gonna i'm gonna do what i can to get there um Mm -hmm. but then obviously you'd be given the tools and and that's but though but it's just knowing in those moments because that's what we're trying to do at that at that time when someone's in that desperate situation as a therapist or as a family member as a friend you know you're just trying just buy time you know some Mm-hmm. you'd often hear people and, and people that are listening like, what, geez, what would I do if my friend said to me or something like that buy as much time as you can to try and get that peak moment to pass mm-hmm. so they can hear you and say okay so, so maybe if I keep my life then that's the best way to end this pain and it's getting that point across yeah. absolutely and, and I love that kind of the, the, the way I look at that uh, kind of way and different analogies different kind of quotes or sayings um a kind of quote that i loved was um rock bottom became the fa- solid foundation of where i rebuilt my life um and i kind of love yeah. that kind of quote but i love the kind of you know visual aspect of i've hit rock bottom here the structures of the house is completely fallen down but yet now i have a chance to rebuild the structure here in a different way because the same house that you know was once there before is not going to be helpful. Those structures that were in place are going to, just going to dwindle again if I get back to that. So let's build it differently. Let's get these foundations in place and let's build up again. And even the way I looked upon was, you know, rebooting my mind. And when it became the kind of that person of, you know, wanting a bit of this life, wanting a bit of, you know, something in, in the future and looking forward um, and actually having, um, you know, clarity in my own mind that, these thoughts that are going through my head, these irrational thoughts of uh, wanting to die by suicide to end the pain is absolutely not the, not the answer to it. Um, you know, it's going to permanently cause damage to not only, of course, myself, but everyone around me. And it's that kind of, when I was in that moment, and I had guilty moments where I thought I could end the pain and I didn't think for one second the impact that it would have on the people around me, whether it be my friends or family, um or, or or anyone out outside of that circle um and that was certainly a guilty kind of thought that i had as well i had a number of times where i felt like i don't care it will just be so good for me if i can just end this right now and it will be the better for absolutely everyone around me um and it begin to believe that thought process you believe to kind of 
I guess, convince yourself of this is the way out. Um, and I was so glad that I had so many good people around me that kind of brought me back to that kind of reality of, you know, real life people meaning something to me. And deep, deep down, I knew that I had it right down and grain me that I wanted to be part of this world. Um, and that's maybe why I never took that step. That so many times I wanted to, but deep, deep down, I knew I wanted to be part of it. I knew people loved me. I knew I was worth a bit of something. Um, but it's about exactly getting to that point, and it's so hard. I've because I've been to that yeah. point. It's so hard to rationalize that when you're at that point. But once you kind of get that clarity, you know, it's it's so so beautiful to know that you have a life to look forward to thereafter. Yeah, like it's very difficult when you when you like it. We speak about these things with kind of a a a, a perfect narrative, you know, like these moments in time. But mm -hmm. when you're living it, it feels like an eternity, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like what got me out of those situations i think was that idea that um i have these people to live for and i actually didn't want them to i rationalized it as i didn't want them to feel they would probably feel like i felt in that moment if i did that mm -hmm. i didn't want anyone else to feel like me so but i was lucky that i was able to get to that rationalization because mm -hmm. you're you're there's a fork in the road there and a lot of people don't and a lot of people rationalize it as everyone's better off and i think it's very dangerous when people start to think that the world is better off if I wasn't in it. Yeah. Um, that's the point where um, people are at, at acute levels. And as Noel said, you just have to buy the time, get them through it um, and there's get them to the point where they can gain that perspective. You know? Sorry, Chris, there's also the thing, you know, we've talked about this in, in other episodes of, so, th so that's the kind of the, the reactive part of it. But it's important as Shane will know this. It's really, really, and we all know it really. Um, it's important to have to be proactive in it. So if someone kind of goes, why is, why is doing the podcast? What's the whole point of this? It's to be proactive because mm -hmm. if you already, it's the, the set and the set and setting kind of, you know, if you're walking into something that's already out there. So for example, if as an 18 year old kid and the, the, we, he hears a conversation, goes, Oh, I think I've heard this before. And we can still go into that deep hole. Mm -hmm. But if he's gone into the hole coming from a place that they've already talked about this, it's like, Oh, Oh shit. I remember that now, whereas Shane and, and myself and lots of other people and, and we were kind of walked into that hole, but we didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to hear it new. But if you've already heard something, at least it's there. It's in the memory. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I want to talk about Leinster final day, Shane, um, mm -hmm. but I'm also very interested in uh, just from a personal perspective. You, you did eventually, you know, speak to your mom. I think it was the first person you talked to. Um, but you had to muster the courage. You either made a decision to tell her or it just came out of you. Okay. And mm -hmm. for me, um, you know, I think the first time I really told the people closest, closest, closest to me how, how, how really bad it was, was last year, I think in like March, I had a, I had a breakdown and it was just circumstantial. Mm -hmm. I just kind of. I don't like using the word broke, but I, I broke. Okay. And the people that needed to hear what I needed to say were there mm -hmm. because of lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thankful to lockdown for, for that. It was, it was the most, I think, um, heavy periods of growth and spiritual growth and all sorts of growth I've ever had in my life because we were forced to be together at that moment of time. And I, I was forced to kind of let this all out. But did you, you know, leading off to that moment, did you kind of crack and, and let it all out by accident? Or did you say, oh, I have to say something? I, I think when I look back, it was a blessing in disguise. It was circumstantial, but for a number of weeks leading up to that point of, you know, telling my mom what, you know, what little I did know what was going on for me, at least. And um, I was trying to build up the courage for many, many kind of months at that stage. And um, I unfortunately kind of had the thoughts of dying by suicide for many months at that stage. And I was thinking... I want a bit of the part of this world. I got that clarity in me. I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to act upon it. Okay, I need to reach out. And how do I reach out? Um, which was then my next question. And the difficulty that I had was in around that time of thinking that I wanted to speak up, my granddad passed away firstly. And then six weeks after, my nanny had passed away too. Yeah. Both my mom's side. So all the while, all the stress that I was under, okay, I need to speak up. What will I say? How will I approach it? What will I do? All this was going on, on the other side. So every time I was like, okay, I'm ready to go. We were hit with a desolate low first off with my granddad and then with my granny. So I was thinking that exact piece that you were, you were saying you were fearful of 
burdening those around you. I didn't want to burden, especially my mom. She's lost both her mom and dad within the space of six weeks. And I think yeah. at that point then, after the passing of my nanny and a couple of weeks have passed, um, that lens are fine in the morning. Um, if I was to put it that the game is over, um, those kind of cracks that my mom and dad did later admit um, that they thought they were seeing for many, many months was right in front of my mom's eyes. It was the first time that she'd seen her 19-year-old, six foot three son in a flood of tears. Um, and for, for her, I guess it was obviously a reconfirmation of what she thought she was seeing. Um, she, of course, didn't know the extent of what it was right in front of her. Um, and I didn't speak a whole lot to her um, in around that time, but I definitely knew that I wanted to speak up at that stage. I was thinking the game is over here. I'm, I can't hide this anymore. I'm literally in a flood of tears. My mom has seen me for the first time. So let's not, why, why not take this step? Um, and the step that I did take wasn't a massive one in, in the context of I didn't tell her everything, but it was massive in another context that I took that first step of saying a couple of words, yeah, of saying I've been of feeling this way for so many years. Again, not being able to rationalize it in my head or kind of have a clarity of like exactly this has happened, this has happened, this has happened. But at least it was then airing out for the first time that someone else was known exactly what was going on for me. Yeah, I'm going to speak about this later, Shane, but I think that um, for me personally, I don't know about you, but when you do tell people, you tell them in, it's almost like you're testing um, put something out and then you tell a little bit more and mm. a little bit more and there's still things inside of me that I haven't explained to people because I'm just not ready to mm. you know there are like things that I, are people I need to speak to and 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 you know I, I, I want to tell certain people uh, how I feel and eventually I will get there and I'll tell the people who are important um, enough you know I'll tell them what I need to tell them and you know, you know, I still have that sense of protection in me, uh, and I, I am only guessing, but I, I have, you know, it's a high degree of probabil probability that you have it in you that you still want to protect the people um, around you. You know, you mm -hmm. still want to make sure that they're okay, and you know that they're not carrying the burden of your burden all the time. You know, mm -hmm. our, our parents always worry about us, um, and I hate knowing that my parents worry about me because I worry about them fucking constantly. Mm -hmm. So it's this constant circle of worry that it's not good for anyone, you know. Um, but I, I, I want to talk to you about the day of the Leinster final, and just to set the scene for people uh, listening, I'm, I haven't been very good, good at this in, in previous podcasts. But for people who don't know exactly what's happening here, Shane is what age are you at the time, Shane? Uh, nineteen. He's nineteen. Okay, so he's playing for Dublin. Um, it's the day of the uh, Leinster final. Mm -hmm. Leinster is a province in Ireland. Who are you playing? Uh, Mead. Mead. Okay. Yeah. He just has this moment with um, his mom. He's in his bedroom, and then, uh, like, they have to make a decision to um, allow him to play the game, or he has to make a decision to play the game. Um, and the game, like, it, it ends up being not what I expected. You know, kind of, I read it in disbelief, like, what the fuck is, is going on? How can this happen? But can you can you tell us what happened in the game or, or how the game panned out for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the whole day, I was unsure of whether I was going to play um, throw the tears at my mom a big cliff walk with my sister in the middle of the day um, had landed at the match um, no fuel into me I think I had half a sup of water half a sup of Luke's aid um, and for any of the listeners absolutely not the most idyllic thing to be doing before a massive match um, for any physical exercise at all but particularly for a match um, and what was going on for me then when I got out on that pitch it was if when I crossed the white line, the dark demons stay there at the side and I could be that kind of kid in the playground, that happy shame once more. And when I was pounding every single blade of grass, I'll, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget those 60 minutes. And, and I think I said it in the book where I'd say to this day, seven years on, it was the most satisfying 60 minutes of football I've ever played in my life. I was like a kid in the playground again. I was running around, not a thought in the world of just man, ball, let's win this match um, and I didn't want to get off, get off the pitch I was in my safe haven um, and it was a place where I felt like it could really be me I could really express who I wanted to be on the outside on the outside world I guess um, and I even remember moments of you know half time 
you know, thinking, you know, you want to get a breath here, you want to get a, a bit of fluids and uh, kind of reevaluate what was going on for the first half. That was an inconvenience to me. <laughs> I remember like standing up in the dressing room. I didn't even sit down. I stood up in the dressing room like, come on, lads, I need to get back to this here. As in like, you know, I, this is like a burden to, to what I was feeling. Um, and I, I, it's, uh, it's strange to think about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's even smiling, telling the story. You can't see him, <laughs> but um, he's recounting this with, with a broad smile. So you like you're at halftime, mm -hmm. you're raring to go. Yeah. Um, you win the game, don't you? We win the game by, I think I might remember maybe four or five points. And, and Shane gets mad at the match. Yeah. So think about that for a second. He's just had perhaps. I don't think it's the nadir, the bottom point of your entire story, but it's it's certainly the lowest point you've had, mm -hmm. the most emotionally vulnerable you've been, probably in your entire life to that point. Mm -hmm. And you go to this game and you, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of flow state, mm -hmm. but you, you find this sense of flow state like you, and there are points in your book where I think you touch on mindfulness in the end, you, you, you begin talking about meditation, but early on you say that study and exercise, they were distractions, you know, distractions are just things that get us into this state of, of, of flow where we are here and now in the present there, we are kind of. Um, no one and I have been back and forth about this episode of the Peak Performance Podcast with Johnny Wilkinson, where I don't know if you've ever heard or listened to this particular episode, but mm. I'll send it to you afterwards if you haven't, because it's it's absolutely profound. It's not what you expect to hear from Johnny Wilkinson. Um, it was the epitome of of hard work, you know. But he talks about all of him in every moment. That's what he wants for a, a, that's his prescription for a happy life, mm -hmm. or a good life, a content life. And you, in that moment, were the real shane carty you know you were the shane carty that you knew yourself to be mm -hmm. and it didn't matter if there were a million people watching you there you know you were the shane carty that you were comfortable being kicking a football you know and, and running around and you know even those descriptions feel childlike mm -hmm. but it's the juxtaposition of you know this hellish moment of telling your family mm -hmm. um with this euphoria of you know playing your fucking socks off, getting man of the match, winning the game, and then the immediate um, uh, kind of fallback to, okay, now I have to deal with the reality of this situation again. Mm -hmm. And I always talk to people about uh, confronting um, your discomfort, mm -hmm. like leaning into the discomfort, because so much of us spend so much of our time um, distracting ourselves, not introspecting. And I worry for people that have never um, had the, I, I see depression as a bit of an opportunity for, for people like you and I, not, not that getting to the suicidal stage is a positive, but you and I have both now come to a stage where we're very self-reflective mm. and most people don't get that opportunity because they don't, they aren't confronted with this, this idea of you have your, you know, you're mentally ill. Um, and most people think of the mind when you talk about the mind, they're like, oh, don't be talking about that, you know, woo woo bullshit. You know, you're talking about yeah. some sort of philosophy, you know, or some Eastern religion or, or, or something. But no, you have a brain. I'm sorry. Everyone has a brain and everyone walks around with this. Um, but that particular moment to me in the book, I kind of had to stop and go, what the hell, you know, how, how did that happen? You know, and the moments preceding that or after that game, what, what happened to you? Immediately after, um, cast open the pedestal, collect my man of match award, and I wanted to get off that pedestal as quick as, as I went up. Um, went back in the dressing room, put my award back to my gear bag. Lad celebrating around me, that exact thing of not feeling the elation that I should have felt, particularly after getting the man of the match. And uh, not only win the Leinster final, but the man of the match itself. Um, and I went off home with my mom and dad. Uh, the following day, I found myself on a on a plane off to Stockholm. Um, that is that's where my sister Michelle um lives to this day. Um, she moved over in 2013, and I guess the reasoning behind that was that my mom and dad thought that I was perhaps hiding something uh, from them that I wasn't quite comfortable uh, confiding with them in, and that I could share with my older sister Michelle because I had always done that in in years previous. Anything, any dealings that I had that I wasn't quite comfortable with, I always went to my older sister Michelle, and they were thinking, okay, this is just another example of that. Um, but little did they know, little did she know what I was coming to her with. Um, and even that time around Stockholm, I went to Copenhagen, back to Stockholm. That was 
a dark, dark time in my life, uh, to put it mildly. Yeah, and that, that part of the book wrecked me. Um, there was this moment where you, I think you had gone for a walk or they were bringing you for lunch or, or something like that, and mm. you described the moment where like you just couldn't hold it in anymore. Mm -hmm. you kind of been like dancing around it, and then you just burst into tears, you know, head in hand, and, you know, described it to them, or I, to the best of your ability, described uh, what you were feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just, <clears throat> it touched me, but it also brought back horrible memories. And, and, you know, sometimes we're like forced into this position and then it just has to come out of us that like, this is what's going on. And it, it's like an outpouring of emotion. You, you know, like, I don't know if you remember what it was like, but I remember telling people and just being like, sounding like a blabbering idiot, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, just being like, I can't do this anymore. You know, I need to get it out of me or, or you know, I don't know what the fuck is going on, but please help me. You know, I, I can't describe it properly. Mm -hmm. um, but that that particular point, like of the book set me off, you know, then for the rest of the book, I couldn't stop crying. Every time you mentioned something, I was like, oh, fuck, here we go again. <laughs> um, but but this, this led up to uh, you coming home and I thought it was very poignant that you were describing you didn't want to come home and I, mm -hmm. I've been there you know when you go on holidays and you don't want to come back to your real life mm -hmm. um, and you do come home and there's this period you know from the point of telling your parents to to being um, admitted to St. Pat's is about two weeks I think you, the actual name of the chapter is those two weeks or something like that yeah. um, and you eventually get into St. Pat's mm -hmm. okay and you know, I think it's fair to say that because of the position you're in and who you are and whatever, things were expedited for you. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know that um, just being admitted to St. Pat's isn't as easy as, as just having a mental illness. Now you, you've, there's a lot of things you have to do and, you know, seeing psychologists and that kind of stuff is is difficult for people. You know, I was able to hire Noel um, because I have means. I know a lot of people who are trying to use the public system who... Um, are on long, long waiting list, but we can talk about that uh, later on in the episode. But c can you talk to us about St. Pat's and mm -hmm. your experience um, of St. Pat's, what you thought when, before you went to St. Pat's, um, you know, what it did for you, the people there, the relationships you built, mm -hmm. you know, let, let's, let's go through it. Yeah, so St. Pat's, to, the first uh, and the abiding memory that I have on my first ever morning um how I'd gotten in there, I'd essentially taken a panic attack. So my kind of next memory was uh from taking a panic attack on the say, outside world was then being woken up on the other side of a mental hospital. Um two softly spoken nurses right by my side telling me where I was. Um and immediately once I'll I'll never forget the time when I said mental hospital, I took myself to Shutter Island. Um one of my all time favorite films. Um and I, have have you seen it? Have you seen Shutter, Shutter Island? Yeah. Oh, of course. What a what a Brilliant. what a banger. What a film. Right. <laughs> in <laughs> in so many weird and fucked up ways. It's a great film. But immediately the analogy that I brought myself and the and the imagery that brought myself to was that exact thing that they painted in Shutter Island of a dark dreary room, people in straight jackets, headbutt and walls. And that's absolute I was convinced. I was convinced that's where I was. Um and that immediately kind of scared, of course, to put it mildly again, scared me to the core. Um, and I very quickly realized within, I would say, a few minutes, 20, 30 minutes of being told where I was and being told, you know, you need to go into the breakfast room. Even at that, I was like, I'm not going into the breakfast room, kind of thinking that I'm going to see people, you know, exactly what I thought it was in Shutter Island. Uh, and it was anything but. When I went into the breakfast room, I met people who I'm still friends with today. They made those couple of days maybe that bit easier than what it should have been. Um, and immediately, I would say, within a couple of hours, just kind of get my feet in the ground and a small bit of clarity and a small bit of headspace, my immediate irrational perception of a mental hospital diminished. Um, and to kind of paint a picture that I was set into this uh, semi-secure unit. Um, so you're confined to a certain area of a 10 by 10 garden. Um, you have a corridor of rooms, maybe, I think, if I'm right in saying, maybe six or seven each side. Um, and then you kind of have like an open kind of area where you have beanbags, you have chairs, you have a TV, you have a coffee stand. And then the nurses are just, you know, going about the area, just checking up on you and everything um, to paint a picture. That's what it was like. Um, and that was my first kind of initiation into it. And um, I was I think you touched upon that point of denial. I was certainly in denial. 
of where I was. Um, I was certainly in denial of what I was facing up to. Um, and it was only after a number of weeks being in there that a massive turning point for me, and I think you can relate to this, Chris, as well, where that acceptance piece of yeah. I am where I am. I am dealing with what I'm dealing with at, at the minute in the shape of depression. And even when was when that was diagnosed, I was like, you think maybe I've seen that as a negative. I've seen that as a huge positive that I actually can name what it it is because that's all it was to me. It was it. I didn't know what mental health, as I said, depression, whatever it may be. Once I was diagnosed, it was like, okay, I've accepted where I am. And I kind of, I would say the 11 weeks I spent in total um, was hugely up and down. I had many, many dark moments, I'd many bright moments. Um, but that's exactly what depression is in its essence. It's, it's up and down and it's about how, how you are dealing with those highs and lows. Um, and I was slowly learning that as I went through a number of group therapies and other kind of um realm that i wasn't subjected to up up until that point um and even i kind of touched upon you know the institution that it is that the ease of conversation around mental health it was like talking about the weather you know people ask me oh what are you in for you on medication i was like are you are you allowed to ask me this and (laughs) you know is this allowed but um i was slowly being intertwined into that kind of normalization of the conversation that i needed to have so many years previous um, and it was a total massive, opposite. massive learning. Yeah. It was the total opposite of what you were used to. Just the, the shock to your mind, I'd say. Incredible. And, and, and that's the thing. It, it did get, a, it took me a long, long time. I'd say two or three weeks to get a lot of getting used to. And even to touch upon maybe even a story that put it into perspective for me was um, uh, when Mick Galvin. So uh, as you said, I've, I had a big hand in terms of the people who were around me, the resources that I was very, very fortunate to have uh, in the shape of Desi Farrell, who was my manager. Uh, for Dublin and Mick Galvin, who was a selector, um, who had a couple of contacts in St. Pat's to get me in um, so quickly. And he had said to me, Shane, look, I know football is a massive part of your life. I was so tunnel vision and thinking that was the only thing going on for me. He'd said, look, if you park to the side and you f- solely focus on your mental health for the next two or three months, whatever it takes, you've 80 years of your life to look forward to. And it's, it yeah. probably sounds so simple, but to put it in that perspective, that broadened my horizons to think, Okay, I'm I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go after this. I'm gonna give it the best of my ability. Those kind of things that were ingrained so many years ago from my dad. Do this to your best of your ability, and that was then my kind of thing of okay, I'm gonna go after this as hard as I can, and let's see where it takes me. It's funny that you you bring back that um, application of of hard work to um, something like this. I, I do the same. I, I I'd be remiss not to tell people that um, if you have a mentality like Shane and I, that you have to be careful about how you approach your mental health and, and Noel will tell you this you know he'd be the first to tell you that I have had lots of times where I've done too much you know? mm. I, uh, I had your uh, everyone's fucking morning routine stacked on top of morning routines and night <laughs> routines and you know I was over exercising and um, you know over managing everything I was tracking every little detail in my day and all, all these kind of things you know I think sometimes we have to be careful just to let go mm-hmm. you talk about that acceptance um and I, it, it's evident from the book. Um, and I think that people need to buy the book and read the book, especially people who have experienced depression, just for the sense of resonance you'll get um, in, in sharing in Shane's story. Um, but also because, you know, we are doing a podcast here. I can't tell you the the all the details um, and, you know, the, the emotional turning points and, and the nice telling details that, that Shane gives in, in the book. Um but it's very evident as you kind of close out your time in St. Pat's and um, mm-hmm. you go through the, the young adult program um, that you you have widened the aperture through which you, you see the world, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you talk funnily. I should have trademarked this fucking thing, but I use a mental health toolkit as well. I don't know. Is that <laughs> something that I got from you? No, I don't know. I, I, I continue to steal people's ideas. But, um, I, I have the same thing you know, of, of the I like this idea that. There are a series of things that I can pull out of the box when I need to. Mm-hmm. And there are a series of things I just have to do every day. And, you know, today when I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that I'm feeling low, there are a series of things I need to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, if I go straight back into work after this, I'll um, avoid it and then it will build up. So I need to kind of, I need to go for a walk and I need to, um, like I meditate daily. So I normally, when I get to this stage, I'll, I'll meditate maybe twice. Mm-hmm. I need to journal. 
So I need to I need to write through how I feel right now, um, and what I need to do to get out of it. And you know, I I try to question what came about. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'll talk about your book, and I'll talk about the memories that are brought up, and I'll, it'll it, the things that are brought to the fore. Like I still need to have some conversations. You know, there's mm-hmm. an element of fear there about that and an anticipation. So can you talk about your um, toolkit mm-hmm. and you know what you <coughs> you pull on and some you know people love techniques but it's not always a technique uh, it's just things you do i guess but yeah um I, I, and i think it's important in, in terms of that kind of the mental health toolbox it's important to even say it's very individualistic what works for me may not work for you but it's important for people to realize what works for you and about you know picking those tools and on, on those bad days um, and if i were to name my top three it probably comes as no surprise as, as physical exercise is there number one um, it got me yeah. through two years at the worst point in my life um, and hopefully the worst point that I'll ever get to in my life. Um, so I still rely upon it on these, these days when I do have my bad days um, and to be open and transparent as, as we all are here, as, as you have been, Chris, quite often in saying that we all have our good and bad days um, and right to this day. I'm not sitting here saying I released a book and everything is rosy in my world because it's not. Um, and then to kind of follow on from that, I guess number two, the kind of playlist or podcasts that I like to kind of those kind of things that brings me to a happier time and place, whether it be with a family member, a friend or a certain holiday. And those kind of things that, you know, remind me of places that bring me to uh, a way, I should say, from the kind of negative perceptions that may be kind of going in in my head. Um, And then number three, I would say, is talking to friends. You know, I'll be probably through what we're doing here through Zoom or, or or whatever it may be, Microsoft Teams or anything like that. But just talking to friends, and I I spoke about that kind of ease of conversation, um, that I have with my friends now that I can pick up the phone, I can meet them for coffee and say, lads, I am up the walls here. I know I need to talk to you about this, this, and this, and that kind of individual nature. If I if I refer to a story, if if that's okay, back in St. Pat's in what was called the Young Adult Program. He touched upon it there and we're going around in our group therapy session speaking about our mental health toolbox, you know, what do you refer to on your bad days? And of course I speak about physical exercise, music, meeting up with friends, speaking to them. And it turned to the right of me as it were as a 20 year old male. Um, and he said, I do a bit of knitting. And I was looking at like, I kind of, I was looking around. I was like, did, did that chap just say that? And then, like the next day I found myself knitting in this group therapy session. My dad absolutely came me for it. Um, it absolutely <laughs> didn't work for me but I think it's just a prime example of like he was 20 years of age knitting was in his mental health toolbox I was 19 years of age physical exercise was in my mental health toolbox so he knew it was good for him he went after it every single day and as did I so find what works for you and put it in there every single day yeah like um, I believe in this idea that mood follows action you know mm-hmm. and uh, we can down regulator up regulator mood and uh, there's this very good book called the, the buddha's brain or the buddha's mind or something and he's prescription for like a a good life is i'm not sure if you're familiar with the like sympathetic nervous system but there's parasympathetic and sympathetic i'm sure like mm-hmm. the the smart scientists around the dublin team have talked to you about this and down regulating and um, going parasympathetic after games and all of this kind of stuff mm-hmm. and his prescription is to live largely in the parasympathetic state which is kind of your rest and digest state and to have periodic bouts of sympathetic which is kind of your fight flight fight 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 or flight um state um and i i get the sense with people that um you know they want to attack this you know when they're ill they want to attack it and they want to combat it and they use all these kind of military um uh, terms but what i have found to be useful for me is more about um it's more about recognizing it's more about awareness and it's about i try and um become aware of what is perhaps happening to me i feel like it's like going through me you know Mm -hmm. like i feel like the depression the early signs i'm feeling right now are are like something that is like a whoosh that's going to go through me and if i'm aware of it and i allow it to pass and i kind of recognize what's happening and then i can reframe it because i have a fear i don't know if you have this fear of remission um mm. i i fear and i hate to use this expression but losing my mind you know i, I fear mm-hmm. uh, and I, it it taints certain aspects of my life you know um and i wanted to ask you about this you know on a, on a personal level um about how 
you know, depression has humbled me, I guess, mm. in, in a way that I have had to kind of reimagine my life a little bit. Mm. Um, but you have this toolkit now and you have these, these, you know, I think people have, I've heard other interviews with you and in, in your book, and I think there people want to put a sense of finality to it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, this isn't a fucking Hollywood movie, you know, things <laughs> just don't end like that. Um, I, I am of the belief that I will likely live with this, um, disorder or illness or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. you know, function of the mind for my entire life. Do, do you, do you think that you've had to kind of reimagine your life to live with this mm -hmm. depression? Um, and, and do you think that it has humbled you in any way? Or are there any of your aspirations that you've been like, look, I just, I need to, you know, pull back on that or I'm going to change the, my behavior in, in this respect? Yeah, I, I think it comes back to the kind of the point that I made about that acceptance piece. Um, I'm, I'm not naive in thinking that I've come such a long way that this is something that I don't need to look after anymore. Um, and I'm completely fine with that. Um, and that was, as I said, a massive turning point for me was accepting that piece that this is just like I look after my physical health every single day. I'm going to look after my mental health every day. It's just another part of the structure or, or kind of systems that I have to go after every single day to make sure I'm all there. And that, I guess, exactly what I've spoken to with people. And it's funny that you say it, that kind of fear of remission and going back to the point where you once were. And yes. it's possibly you could say I've put pressure on myself to, to kind of make sure that I don't. But I've always said, and I'm, and I'm very, very, I would say firm in the stance that I will never get back to the point that where I once was simply because of the amount of structures and support systems that I have there. Of course, I, I can have points where I, you know, fall back and, and have my good and bad days. I've even, as I spoke about at the top of the podcast, I've been quite overwhelmed these last kind of couple of months. But the beauty of it is that it only took me a couple of weeks to realize that, where it took me a couple of years the last time. So you know, I've so, yeah. too many people, too many resources, too much help around me to allow me to get back to that point. And I'm very, very confident in the fact that I can rely upon that. I can trust in that. And I know that deep down. Um, and yeah, you, you could you could say you could look it upon as a pressure aspect that um, I'm possibly, you know. Yeah. Um, well, look, just person to person, uh, person who's had depression to person who has had depression. Um. I think that I've had to recognize that, you know, just getting up in the morning and putting a smile on my face, I'm, I, I have had to say, I accept that I'm enough in, in that respect, you know, mm -hmm. everything else after that is like a, a bonus for me. Um, and what I'd say to you is that, you know, don't put pressure on yourself to, to mm -hmm. be well all the time, you know, yeah. you know, you talk about that acceptance. I have had a lot of time where perhaps I've spent, um, uh, an inordinate amount of time mm. studying this stuff and trying to understand it and it's theoretical yeah um, to me and then sometimes it becomes internalized through experience but you know i have been with noel for five years now so he's seen a lot of it the snapshots the the highs and the lows and the peaks and the troughs are less frequent and they're less severe for sure yeah but you know even when we started this, I think Dan's probably seen it twice um, already. And, and he, he's only known me since last June. So um, my last kind of episode, I think, was in October. But that I, I the immediate effect that has on me is I'm like, you fucking idiot. You know, you let it happen again. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? What is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. like, I don't, why do you keep You don't call me happen? an idiot. No, me. <laughs> myself. I was like, why are you letting this happen, Dan? <laughs> uh, but like, I, that's what I go through. You know, I, I, I keep deriding myself because I'm like, no, you can't. You have to like maintain this like optimal level all the time. And I read in your book about you kind of taking a step back from your masters. And mm -hmm. I'm just very glad that at, at the beginning you were kind of saying, look, I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. Um, yeah. Like for me, what I've the stage that I've come to is that when I start to feel overwhelmed, I continually <clears> like question. Why do I feel overwhelmed? What is what is it that I am doing that is making me feel like this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I spoke earlier about what Noel and I have been doing about this kind of idea of congruence. And congruence is that there are experiences, okay, and then there are the emotions of that experience, and then there's what um, you feel in your mind, right? And there, if there is not a connection and all of those come together, then you are kind of like being torn apart. It's what's called cognitive dissonance. You have like, you're mm -hmm. in two minds all the time. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, my appeal to you would just to be um, kind to yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. Noel always is asking me just to be a bit kinder to myself. And I'll go around telling everyone that, like, yeah, I'm taking care of myself, you know. Leave me the fuck alone, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I know all about it. You know, I can spout the most fucking um, uh, bullshit of anyone I know about this stuff. But, you know, in the moment, am I going to actually take the time off? Mm-hmm. Or am I actually going to um, accept that I'm I'm at a low point now, mm-hmm. you know? To, like, I, I can notice it in a day now. So I can, I know the day before, I know probably today is going to be acute or tomorrow. And I know that I can kind of get through it if I do these things. Um, but I, I will still deny it up to that point. And I will still go around telling everyone that I'm grand, uh, even though I'm probably feeling overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that act- has actually worked for me is I continually tell people that are in my inner circle, um, these are the signs. And I've actually heard someone recently say that they wrote out all of the signs of their depression and they gave it to their uh, wife. Wow. The early signs. And they said, you remind me. Um, when this happens mm-hmm. because I have continually gone around being like I'm grand I'm grand I'm grand leave it alone I'm fine I'm working on it I'm, I'm getting psychotherapy I'm doing all this stuff I'm exercising every day don't worry about it I'm meditating every day I'm fine and then I won't notice it's that justification thing and then all of a sudden I'll start making bad decisions you know like last night I I was like kind of feeling low and I was like oh, fuck I'll get a takeaway you know uh, my stomach's in bits this morning <laughs> all, those, all those things add up Okay, all those bad decisions then add up and I'll justify and justify and justify and mm. bang, you know, I'm low. Um, but I, you know, my fiance, Paula, knows certain signs. Noel, I work with now as well as uh, he's my therapist, he knows certain signs. He'll text me and he'll be like, you need to take a bit of time off. Uh, a lady that, that works with me very closely, Gwen, knows things, mm-hmm. you know. Like she texts me this weekend being like, um, cause my fiance had gone to Cork to, to, uh, visit strange, but visit my mother. They're, they're very good friends. And, uh, she had told me basically that you're going to be alone. So, uh, you're probably going to work mm-hmm. cause that's my go-to thing. Uh, when I'm alone, I'll, I'll work. Mm-hmm. And she was like, take a bit of time to yourself, please. Okay. So my, my, my appeal to you is, um, Take it easy on yourself, man. You know, mm-hmm. like what, what age are you? 26? 26, 27? yeah. You still have expectations for yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've heard you say recently that you're, you, you, um, had a bout back in the senior panel and, you know, you've still have aspirations. Absolutely go after them. But if you can learn to detach your self worth from that, um, and learn that you are a person who is living with something that some of those other players don't have, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes we hold ourselves to this kind of benchmark that is, you know, we compare ourselves to other people, mm-hmm. you know, that guy over there probably doesn't have depression. That guy over there probably has anxiety. He's dealing with something different than you. Mm-hmm. He needs to look at life a little bit different. Um, but just remember to be kind to yourself. Remember what the signs are, I guess. You know, you're, you're, you're three or four years younger than me. But a lot's happened in three or four years mm-hmm. for me. I wouldn't, if you had spoken to me at 26, I would have been a lot further behind where you are. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I wouldn't have been intelligently able to speak about it. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be going on podcasts talking about it because I wasn't talking to anyone about it. <laughs> um, so I, I, I am very conscious of where we're at with time wise. We're at an hour 40 now. And w- this has flown. Okay. And I think we could do another podcast um, in itself just about your time in, in St. Pat's and, and the, the young adult program and, and the various things. So I would encourage people if you haven't gotten enough of this conversation um to go find shane on on social media or um you know perhaps he's going to be speaking at an event for you or something like that but get the book okay get the damn book buy the book uh, if you never read it put it on your shelf and someday you will pick it up you will need to read it um but we we always like to close off the show shane with um something called a quick fire round lovely and it's 10 questions um you get five seconds to answer each one <laughs> and there are three that are always bespoke to you okay we just like to end on a kind of a a higher note, I guess, um, and seven that are kind of general. Uh, we're starting to recognize some patterns from from the seven general ones, actually. And so it'll be interesting to see what, you know, a year of this or two years of this will will come back with. We might be able to codify it and get some um, some, some some cool uh, patterns. So you ready? I think so, hesitantly. Yes or no, this is your last gas. No beating around the bush. 
10 questions, come on. Five seconds on the clock, we don't need no hesitating. You don't need a lot of thought. Quick five questions, come on. Dale pronto. Pick up the pace, pick up the pace, pick up the pace. <laughs> Just whatever comes to your head, right? <laughs> so don't, don't, don't be... Um... Uh, you know, thrown off by any of the questions. Just answer whatever the hell comes to your head. There's no smart answer or no right answer. It's just whatever <clears throat> comes to your head. Okay, here we go. Question one. What is your favorite sporting achievement? The Sakers in 2020. Okay. That's the college one, no? Yeah. Yeah. But by the way, I don't fuck all about sports. So if you haven't noticed this yet, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about <laughs> GA. But uh, question two. <clears throat> Uh, favorite pair of boots you've ever owned? Uh, Copa Mundial's. I know if you're going to say it. Why, why does Gap there love Copa Mundial's? <laughs> it's the leather or something, is it? Kangaroo leather. The, yeah. f- the finest piece of leather you'll ever find around. <laughs> Question three. Um, this is a, a, a funny one. I don't know if other people have picked up on this, but two of your best friends have names that are the same as two Simpsons characters. Who are they? Carla Moe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I don't know if anyone else has said that to you, but it was the first thing I picked up when I when I uh, when I saw their name. They always pick up in the mall one. They actually didn't. Uh, they didn't pick pick up in the car one. That's actually interesting. I'm gonna say that to them today. Qu- question four: Name something weird or absurd that you love. Carly Rae Jepsen. I don't know all her music. Very good. <laughs> fun, fun fact: like, uh, I, know, I know he's a quick fire around, but um, my my sister's funny story with that was uh, with a game out in Cork, and we're walking out in the pitch with our headphones on. And, you know, people probably listen to Eminem, Drake. My sister's like, I wonder what he's listening to. They asked me after the match. I was like, uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, call me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but if it puts you in a good mood, it doesn't matter. Uh, question five. Um, name something you couldn't live without. Family. Fair answer. Question six. If you were the last person on earth, what would you still do? Run. <laughs> question seven. If you could broadcast a message to everyone on earth, what would it be? Talk. Very good. Question eight. What advice should young people ignore? Opinion of others. Yeah. Question nine. If you feel overwhelmed, what would you instinctively do? Talk. Or run. Question 10. (laughs) Finish this sentence. At the end of the day, it all comes down to... Fulfillment. Very good. Shane Carty, I need you to uh, plug whatever you want to plug, um, your socials, your book, whatever. I keep forgetting this, but this is the first time I've remembered for a guest. So uh, tell us where to find you. Uh, oh, God. Put me on, uh, Instagram, S underscore Carty underscore. Twitter, uh, S underscore Carty 8. And um, yeah, LinkedIn, just name Shane Carty. Nothing, nothing too, too, too away from that. Um, and then on the side of the street, if you want. Book me for a talk. Where, where, where can I find your book? Uh, Amazon? I'll go bookshops, Eason's, um, and yeah, Dark Blue, The Despair Behind the Glory, My Journey Back from the Edge. Yeah. Brilliant. Buy Irish, buy local. Um, this has been Shane Carty. This is uh, the One DMC podcast. Shane, thank you very much for for everything, um, for coming on, for writing the book, for for being vulnerable, for giving the talks, uh, for, for doing what you're doing. Um, and I hope we get to meet up in person at, at some point. Absolutely. This My is pleasure. Awesome. Over, over and out. Jump out the bed, I got a good yes, reason. Moving the curtain, see the sun through the cold seasons. I got my hoodie because my bones. This has been episode nine of the One DMC podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and a huge thanks to Shane as well for coming on and telling his story. If you want to catch up with us outside of Podcast World, you can check us out on Instagram at One DMC Podcast, or you can check out our website at www.1dmcpodcast.com. That's all from us today. We will see you next week with a brand new episode. Until then, look after yourself, stay safe, and we will see you then. Peace out. Bye bye.